Hi, everybody. Welcome. It is, oh, people are already asking questions. This is exciting. Wow. Uh, it is Thursday, which means that we are back with the Media Vine Summer of Live. I don't know if it's hot, if it's stifling hot where you are, but it is actually nice here in Oklahoma where I am. Jamie, how is it in, in Jersey? <laughs> it is actually really beautiful in Jersey. I can't even do that. Jersey. Joycey. I just say it this as I month. say it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are here this week and I am super, super, super excited because I'm here with one of my favorite humans. It is Jamie Lieberman. She is an amazing attorney and she works with creatives and we're going to talk about some great stuff. But first, I'm going to have Jamie introduce herself. Hi, everyone. It's good to be back. You know, my feelings on both Jenny Guy and Media Vine, <laughs> so I don't need to repeat those, but... I'm Jamie Lieberman. I am from Hashtag Legal, which is a law firm, and we specialize in working with influencers and in, in the influencer space with brands and agencies, um, creatives. We work with lots of service professionals, um, everybody out there that's creating cool stuff. We like to work with you. So, yeah. That's cool. And she is like the answer to all of those things when you are when you're trying to get someone to understand what it is that you do. Because there's lots of lawyers, we all know there's lots of lawyers, but then when you go to them with a specific problem to do with this industry, this blogging industry, this creative industry, um, and you explain that to them, and they, a lot of them, I've heard many stories, horror stories, of trying to have a paper solution imposed onto a digital problem, and that doesn't necessarily translate um, and that's what we have wonderful people like Jamie and Danielle and their their business for. So um, I have Jamie on a lot because she's an expert on many things, but I'm really excited to have her on today because we're going to talk about something that goes a bit beyond just legal. Um, we're going to talk about negotiation. And I, to me, I think this is one of the more neglected things that uh, is goes through all businesses. And it isn't really taught in many schools of business. And I, Jamie gave a, a great session at a conference. I think it was two years ago that I saw it. And it was amazing. And it changed the way I negotiate. So that's what we've got her here for. We're getting questions. I want you guys to ask your contract questions. Ask your questions of Jamie. But Jamie, let's just start out with, give us your top tips on negotiating. And, and talk a little bit about your experience negotiating for us. Sure. So I actually love negotiating. I'm one of those people who gets like really excited for it. <laughs> so, I know. <laughs> I, I know. I know. I'm not going to apologize for it. Um, negotiating should actually not be stressful, particularly if you arm yourself with information. So that is my number one tip. Do your research. Before you even go into a phone call, before you even send that email, um, and we're going to get to the phone call part, but do your research, spend your time thinking about and learning about who you're negotiating with, what their pain points are, how you can help with those pain points. And then not only should you be thinking about the person that you're negotiating with, but think about yourself. What are your pain points? What do you want to achieve from this negotiation? And spend a lot of time. And that doesn't just mean Google searches but it can mean asking other people for information about who you're negotiating with or other people you may know who've been in similar situations, what you're negotiating. Cause you can, there's so many things that we negotiate in business. And so the number one piece of advice I have is gather your information. My second piece of advice is know your walk away position. You have to have your position. You know, when you're going to say no, if you don't have a walkaway position, you don't have a negotiation. So you have to be willing to walk away at a certain point when the negotiation or when the agreement no longer makes sense for you. But in doing that, while knowing your, your walkaway position, you should also know what I call your BATNA, which is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. So while the agreement may not go through, something awesome may come from that and it may set itself up for an agreement later. So, and then my last piece of advice is get on the phone. <laughs> I, I know this strikes fear in a lot of people's hearts who live online. I, I get it, but I will tell you that it is frequently more effective, more efficient, and you get way more information when you pick up that phone. I'm not saying we need to cold call. That's not what I'm saying. But if given the opportunity, <laughs> don't just start calling people. But if given the opportunity and if the opportunity presents itself, 
hop on that phone. Don't shy away from it. There's so much great information you can get from a phone call. Those are amazing tips. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to make sure that we don't, <laughs> we are not advising you to cold call people and say, hello, I want to negotiate with you. That's not the way. <laughs> That's not the way to start out. But the thing is, um, I've seen Jamie so many times, uh, and you don't have to say, I would rather talk about this on the phone, saying something like, you know, I, I'm open to, to however this would be easiest to do for you. And I, I'm, I'd love to jump on a phone call if you've got, if you've got 15 minutes for me this week. Um, the thing I'm going to add that you said that, that I love to say and love to use is to, it's the listening. And that will you talk a little bit about the taking a pause that I heard you talk about? Because that to me is so genius and it works every time. You got it. So listening is a very big part of information gathering. And I give an entire talk actually about the art of listening. And there's so much that goes into the art of listening because there's a big difference between active listening and passive listening. For most part, most of us, we passively listen. We're doing something else. We're thinking about other things. The art of active listening is when we are just focused on what the other person is saying. We're absorbing the information. And we're not thinking about what we're going to say next. That's a big one. Um, and so because of that, because you are doing this active listening, my piece of advice is pause when somebody's done talking to you. And frequently people get really nervous, right? Because they're like, well, I have to start talking immediately because people want to feel silent. So the pause does two things. The first thing it does is it enables you as the active listener to gather your thoughts. So you can sort of make your notes, think about what question you're going to ask next, what your answer is going to be. And the second thing that's so powerful is people feel silenced. So the other party that you're talking to, they might be like, oh God, I'm silent, I have to talk. And they may start talking again. And sometimes I find frequently, I get the best information after that pause. Because they just start going and you yep. get info that maybe you would not have gotten before. So that pause is incredibly powerful for two reasons. Exactly. And I think also I use that in the inverse with myself is to do the best I can to not feel the impetus to fill every single pause when I'm on the phone with someone. Because you do, if you start thinking about it, you'll find that you'll say anything when you're sitting there feeling like nothing's happening. Like, you know, I really, I just think that tomatoes are this, not great this season. Or you'll say something that you don't want to say because you feel the pressure to feel that, pa feel that pause and you don't have to. There's no reason for it. Yep, that's exactly right. Silence is a okay sometimes. It's golden. <laughs> it is. It, it, <laughs> a wise, a wise person said that. Maybe even to song. Uh, so I think Courtney O'Dell asked a question at the top of the broadcast, and I'm going to go ahead and toss this one in. She wants us to talk a little bit about NDAs and what can and can't be asked, divulged, and recourse. So an NDA is a non-disclosure agreement. Um, I'll right. give a little bit of background for people who may not know. There's two kinds. There's a one-sided NDA or non-disclosure agreement where I'm giving information to Jenny and Jenny's absorbing it. So I'm the person who's giving the information and Jenny's the receiving party. And typically the receiving party would have all of the obligations into the NDA. Then there's a mutual NDA. For example, if Jenny and I both had some amazing ideas that we wanted to share and we would both have obligations to keep certain information confidential. The biggest piece of advice I can give about an NDA is it's really governed by the, the terms of it. There are template NDAs you can use for sure, but really what lets you know what you can and can't divulge is what's written in the agreement. So for example, if I'm sharing a business idea with Jenny, um, I may want to include information about my business plan, my potential customers, you know, the information, the marketing plan that I have. I may say Jenny can't share that with anybody because I want to share it with her for various reasons, whether I'm looking for her to invest or I'm looking for a partner, but I don't want her to be able to tell anyone else about it. And so it is really how you write the NDA is the best way to protect yourself to make sure that you are protecting the universe of knowledge that is you don't want disclosed and that is confidential. Excellent. All right, I wanna dive a little bit into contract world right now. And guys, if you've got questions, post them in there, but we have a bunch from, from many different sources. So what are one or two common big red flags we should be watching for in contracts? 
Well, the first big red flag is when someone doesn't want to sign a contract. <laughs> ah. Yes. So if you approach somebody and you're about to enter into a business relationship, and I actually see this a lot in partnerships between friends or even people who aren't friends. And I get these calls all, these are some of my most common calls I get that are kind of conflict calls. Our friends or people who have met um, and are working together and something sort of goes sideways and there's no signed agreement. And when I say to the person who called me, what's your agreement say about this? And they say, well, the other side wouldn't sign one. That should always make you pause in all business transactions, because if they don't want to sign an agreement, that is an indicator of potential conflict to come. Having things in an agreement protects everybody. So my number one biggest red flag for people is when you want to sign a contract and someone else doesn't want to. Think about why and what that may mean. Within an actual contract itself, a big red flag is when people take pieces of contracts from other people and sort of smush them together. Um, sometimes you don't know what you're putting in or what it says or, um, and I understand people have budgets. Like I, I understand that when you're starting out with a business, it can be hard sometimes to hire someone to do this stuff. But when I, even as in my capacity as a non-lawyer, which is hard to be, but if someone were to approach me with a contract and I were to look at it and sort of say, ooh, it feels like this was all smushed together, there's not a lot of credibility to that. So that's a really big red flag is when it's one that sort of looks like someone did themselves or didn't do very much research for. That being said, something you do yourself is far better than nothing at all. Um, so if you can't afford it or it's not something that's in the cards for you, try to put something in writing together with as much detail as you can think of. I also just want to say here for people who are like me and do not understand legalese, read it anyway, even if you don't. But I feel like a lot of times it can be intimidating and we just go, I don't know what that means. And then we don't read it and sign it anyway. Yeah. Please read it. Like that's, I think that's step one is you've got to read the contract. And I think the other thing that you said that I love and is so helpful is that as Cher, as in one of our favorite movies, would say in Clueless, this is just a starting off point for negotiations. Yeah. And I think that that is a big thing with contracts. That is not their final response. That's not the final thing they're going to say. So can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. I have never been on the side of a contract where it hasn't been redlined or marked up at least a little bit. Um, no contract, whoever is drafting the contract by its very nature is just going to draft it to the drafter's advantage. That's just psychology of people, right? You're going to protect your side as much as you can, even if you really intend to be very fair. So you have to look at it from the person who's reading it. You have to look at it from your perspective. And there are definitely going to be things in there that you're going to want to negotiate. I mean, there's you can negotiate any part of a contract. But I've never had a client send me a contract with a review where I haven't marked up some part of it or suggested some changes to some of it. It just, it just doesn't work that way. And it's expected. So if someone balks at your negotiation of that contract, another red flag, because there should be a back and forth. It should be as fair as possible. And to make it that way, you have to advocate for yourself. And I think that, yeah, to assume that it's not a, what can we get from them without any sort of reaction, that's the way it's done. So you have to be protected. So where are the best places to scrutinize that contract? Is it scope of work? Is it like, tell me other than just money, which is obviously a place where everyone is looking. Absolutely. But one thing I'll say is each person has something that's really important to them. So you have to really think about like, what are your deal breakers, right? Is it knowing your scope of work? Is it drafts? For some people, they don't mind sending drafts to a client. For other people, that is a deal breaker. They don't want to have to send drafts. So know what is your deal breaker, which is a really big, really great place to start. Some of the places that I see a lot of negotiation are the intellectual property rights. So who owns the content that's being created? And even if the content creator or the influencer continues to own their content, what is the license that you're giving to your client enable them to do? Can they take what the content you've created and stick it in a book and sell it? Can they put it on a t-shirt and sell it to the world? Or can they just repost it? So it's important to know the scope of the license, even if you continue to own it. Sometimes these licenses, they are so broad. 
they allow the brands to give away the content to whoever they want. It, it, that is a really big area where you can negotiate. Exclusivity is another really big one. Um, some people don't care. They're perfectly fine if the, the client wants exclusivity and other people are like, absolutely not. That's going to prevent me from working with other brands. So that's a really good place that you can look. Something as small as not even the money, but payment terms. How long is it until you get paid? How do you get paid? I know there's a lot of chatter sometimes about PayPal because sometimes you, you know, on those fees, if you're paid through PayPal, who absorbs those fees? That's certainly something that you can negotiate where you get paid a little extra. And have- Mediavine does. There you go. I love it. But not all brands do and not all companies do. And so that's another way that you can negotiate as well is the, the fees for how you're being paid. You know, are you going to, can, is ACH possible? There's lots of different options. So that's another way that you can, and you know, when, when the deliverables are due, how you have to turn them in, um, how much social sharing you have to do. That's really scope of deliverables as well. That's a, that's a big area. I see a lot of negotiation. I've also seen how long um, does that post have to stay active and live being another big one uh, that people don't necessarily think about um, from both a brand side and from an influencer side of how long am I going to have to keep this? And if it's exclusive to that brand, how long, how long do I not have to talk to another guitar company or whatever it is? So all of those things. And so when you, when you want to approach a brand and make, a change, a potential change. Do you recommend getting on the phone again for that? Is it okay to send an email? Like, how do you say, um, so I, I'm really excited to work with you, but could we talk about sure. X, Y, Z? So on this one, um, if it's pretty cut and dry, I would actually do it over email because then you're not lost in translation. Um, and you can do it one of two ways. You can send an email back that says, I have cause for concern with clause number five about exclusivity. Or you can actually redline the document. That's what I do. So when a client comes to me with a contract and says, can you review this for me? I actually will redline it and I will make changes to the text. Um, and I redline it so that the their, the brand, whoever my client is, whether it's the brand or the influence or the network, whoever, whoever they're working with can see the changes that I've suggested. And sometimes we just go back and forth on language. Sometimes my client doesn't want me to redline, but I put comments in. I'll say, you know, this is concerning or I'm, I'm not sure that you want to agree to this or can we make this change? And sometimes the other side will just, you know, make those language changes. So if you're a content creator and you're not working with an attorney and you're sort of not sure what even to do, just flag the clause and say, hey, I don't I don't love this. Can we change it to this? And sometimes they'll just make the change for you. It really depends. But unless it's something really long and complicated, I think you can achieve this pretty easily over email. Perfect. Okay. Steffi, our director of influencer marketing. Hey, Steffi. Steffi. Asked a question. So she said, Jamie, can you talk a little bit about how payment terms, speaking of, should be listed when you're working with an agency on behalf of a brand? Um, they've worked, you, she said, you guys have worked on that together before, uh, specifying that they should pay you, not wait for payment from the client first. Correct. So this is definitely something that is a hot topic we see a lot. So a lot of times agencies will slip in that your payment as the content creator is contingent upon the payment from the brand. And so when I'm representing an influencer, my answer to that is always no, (laughs) Um, because you as the agency frequently are, they are taking that risk on. And so the content creator is one step removed and is unable to collect from the brand. The only person they can collect from is the agency. So I will, if I'm representing an influencer, I will take that out. Um, And I will say, I don't, I don't recommend that. So can you actually, just to kind of expand on this. So the agency thing is something, as you said, that's hot because it's happening a lot. And and there's a lot of issue with trying to get to the brand and actually brands are working with the agency because there's a lot of influencers. We understand why We, we do that work ourselves. Can you talk a little bit about working with agencies and best practices for that? Sure. You mean with contracts or just sort of generally speaking? Uh, I would say both. I think we can we can zero in on contracts, but just I know you've dealt with a lot of personal situ- like situations where people have been yeah. caught in a between a rock and a hard place or a brand yeah. in an agency. Absolutely. I think the thing to remember when you're an influencer working with an agency is the agency is your client. Um, they're the one you have the contracting relationship with. 
going around that agency to the brand is never a good idea. Um, I just don't think that's a good practice at all. Even if you are frustrated by what the agency is doing, your relationship is with that agency. I think having a lot of respect for the brand's agency, the agency's relationship with the brand is important. Um, and I think it's important that you get a lot, you just have a really good working relationship with your contact at the agency and you just have a lot of transparency and you meet your deliverables because understand that the agency is relying on you. You know, they've put themselves out there saying they've recommended you as an influencer. And so be making sure you have communications with the agencies, particularly if you're going to be late or something happened or something's going on, just not, not appearing, but letting them know. And so having a really professional relationship between the influencer and the agency enables the agency to get you paid <laughs> and to make sure that that works because the brand is happy and then it, it works really well. And it's good to work with agencies that you sort of know or other people know. The known commodities are also quite helpful. There's a lot of amazing networks out there. Um, that have been doing business a long time and have really good business practices and really are a great advocate for influencers. Could you, and I'm not asking you to name any names, but uh, some red flags for, for that type, for working with an agency when it's time to put your hand up and say, hang on a second. Sure. I think a really big one is, is the agency's ownership of your intellectual property. So I think it's really important that you have an understanding if the agency, what the agency can do with the content that you're creating. So sometimes these agencies, they'll make agreements that are works made for hire. And what that means is they own your content. You don't own it anymore. And so knowing what the agency can do with it. And sometimes the agencies will take a license for themselves with the content. Even though you're not creating the content for the agency, you're creating it for the brand. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not a bad thing. You should just be compensated for that and you should just understand it. So there are definitely times where I have clients do works made for hire all the time because they've been compensated for it and they understand that that's what they're doing. So it's not necessarily a criticism. It's just something that you should know what the agency can do with the content that you are creating. Yeah, definitely important. Always on that on that ownership of the content is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. So Michelle wants to know, uh, I've always wondered at what point does it make sense to bring an attorney on board to help with contracts? Doesn't seem worth it for contracts other under $1,000, but I don't actually know how much attorneys charge for this. Okay. One of your favorite questions, I know. <laughs> That's a good question. So I really believe that um, you should just sort of talk to an attorney, the attorney of choice, and just get an idea for how they do things. Sometimes I can do a contract review in 30 minutes. Um, and I'm never going to talk about rates on any kind of live like that. But, um, but yeah, like you'd be surprised. Sometimes it can be way more affordable than you think it's going to be. Um, and so without knowing the dollar's amount of the contract, without knowing the dollar amount that the attorney may charge, it's really hard to make that analysis. You just assume there's no way I can afford an attorney. And you'd be surprised. A lot of times I have clients go, oh, oh, that, that does make sense for me to get this reviewed because, you know, this contract is a high enough dollar amount. So I think that, that it's just really important to sort of get the information. And there's nothing wrong with finding an attorney that maybe a friend of yours has used or recommends and just asking, you know, can, do you offer this review services and how does it work? Would you say it's a, so it's, it's largely a dollar amount thing when in terms of whether or not it's time to talk to an attorney? I think it depends. I mean, for some people, they don't care about dollar amount. They are always going to talk to an attorney because it matters to them. And I think it just, you have to really think about what your business practices are, what makes sense for you. For a lot of my clients, legal is just a line item in their budget. And they know that it's the same thing as hiring the tech person who's going to help out if your site gets hacked. It's, you're not making money off of the tech person who's helping you out, but they're making sure that your business is protected and that it's growing properly. So I don't necessarily think it's a, always just a dollars and cents thing. I think it depends on the volume of contracts that you do. It depends on you know what kind of work you're creating. Um, there are certain times where for me, a, a, a contract written by a lawyer is non-negotiable. Like if you're licensing content to somebody or you're licensing a technology you've created or you are in a client services agreement. So if you offer coaching services, that for me is sort of a no-brainer. You should always have a contract for that one that an attorney has uh, at minimum reviewed but, and 
hopefully had a part in drafting. Excellent. Uh, so kind of combining both contracts and negotiations here, we're going to do a mashup. What, so when you go back to someone, a lot of times it's money. We know that people want to increase that bottom line. Mm -hmm. And there are often times when that brand comes back and says, I don't have the budget. I can't do that right now. Can you talk about some alternatives to actual cold, hard cash that you can possibly get added in strong ones that will actually be helpful for you as opposed to just um, a lot of free towels or toilet paper, which sometimes is great, but what are some of the creative, we all want toilet paper. It's necessary. Towels and toilet paper. <laughs> Everybody poops, Jamie. That's exactly right. Maybe it's the, the, you know, for a lot of times I see it's like shares um, or the sharing of your content or a use of that person's content. Sometimes it is, um, we've seen people who have gotten a longer amount of time to work on something. Sometimes it's a promise of future work um, saying, you know, we don't have it right now, but in a couple months and putting that into the agreement saying you are going to create this for us and this is what it's going to look like. Sometimes it is exclusivity to you. Um, you know, you're not going to work with other bloggers. You're only going to work with me or, you know, me and a few small people. You're not giving this project to 50 people. Um, that's another way that you can look at it. Like I said, sometimes it's just, you know, something as small as like having your PayPal fees covered, um, which you'd be surprised with the wiggle room is there. Sometimes it is product related, although, you know, it can be a combination if, if that's something that's of value to you, something you would have purchased already. Um, or services. Um, so I've seen those ways to negotiate. Um, it could be less of a license for them to be able to use your content. It could be right. no exclusivity where you can work with their competitor, um, something like that. And sometimes you just do it because you know you're forming a long-term relationship and you, as long as you in the negotiation, particularly if it's a brand that's like on your bucket list, right? Like this is a brand that I wanna work with so badly. And so you sort of say to them, these are my normal rates. I am willing to show you how unbelievably amazing I am so that in the future, when you come back to me, you'll know I am worth far more than the rates that I'm showing you. And sometimes it's just that long-term play. Um, and that I find to be incredibly successful, but you set it up so that they don't think that your rates are what they're paying you for the first time around, but they know that the next time they come to you, it is not negotiable. And so then they'll know and they'll be able to get that budget. Um, and I find that sometimes when you're a proven entity, it's a lot easier to get those extra dollars that you're looking for. Yeah. And I think that uh, um, another big thing is to, to never apologize. I've noticed in a lot, a lot of times that, oh, yeah. that sometimes negotiating can happen with some, I'm sorry, but no. don't, you're not sorry. No, it's a business. So, Going from that, and I'm kind of getting more into the negotiation thing. How do you ask for more money? You just ask. <laughs> you don't. You don't have to worry about it. You don't no. have to feel bad about it. You don't have to. I no. mean, how to without scaring the brand away? I think that's the biggest thing. People are a lot of publishers, and it's understandable. You're terrified that you're going to lose this deal. I guess you have to really weigh like, what does that mean? You know, I have I had a client come to me not long ago. And they had a client, a very, very, very famous name client. And that client had not paid them in four months and owed them Ooh. upwards of $75,000. It was not Ooh. a joke. And they're like, but we're so scared to get you involved. I was like, you don't have a client right now. You have a debt. You know, and it's, <laughs> it's amazing that you are working with this bucket list client. If you're not getting what your worth is, it's not worth it. And so that's sort of knowing when to walk away know what your worth is, know why you're worth what you're asking for. And it is, it's not scaring them away. It's just saying, this is what my value is. And this is why my value is this. And that's the end of it. And so there's ways to obviously, you know, if you sometimes have some wiggle room, I wouldn't even go in there with that apology. I would just be like, these are what my rates are. And this is why. And this is why the phone call is so great because you are able to explain why you are worth this and why it makes sense for them. But you send a media kit or a rate sheet, rate sheet with numbers on it and you're just another person with an email who's given no information other than what your website is and the brand sort of is like, nah, you know? Um, and so forming a personal relationship as best as you can makes people more invested in who you are um, and because they're, they're buying you. 
um, they're buying your website. And so the more of a connection that you can have, the more inclined somebody's going to want to be to work with you and not walk away. And I'll tell you that I've had multiple clients come and say, I'm just scared to counter them. No one's ever going to get your counter and say, I'm never working with you again. No, <laughs> they'll just, the worst thing they're going to say is no. And maybe they'll come out with something else. Maybe they'll just say, no, our original offer still stands. And then you've lost nothing. So it is really, and if you come in there with what your rate is and you come out with sort of the first number and they just say, no, that's out of our budget, it's out of their budget, <laughs> you right. know? That's okay. And I think, you know, that fear of sort of scaring someone away for asking too much, if it's not a fit, you'll feel that and don't force it. So on this, can we talk a little bit about setting rates and, and how, what, what are the factors that go into that? And like, you just gave some great pointers um, that I love, which is being, having, getting on that phone and having the opportunity to explain why you are worth how you are and explain a bit through your process. And I always tell all influencers, when I talk about influencer marketing, do not put your rate sheets or your rates on your media kit because the conversation is over before it's yep. even begun. Exactly. So, but how do you set those? Tell me, tell me how, what you've seen. So I think that it, it's so personal to each person, right? You have to think about who you're talking to. If I have, I, so I have, um, there's a blog that I read that's local to my hometown. Every single mom reads this blog. Like this is just, they are the go-to and they have these like unbelievable resources. They're on the tip of everybody's tongue. But if you looked at their hard numbers, because the city that I live in, you know, how many moms are in it? They're not hundreds of thousands of followers, but they have the most fervent, engaged followers. And if they say go buy a service or go buy, people go. And so that's the conversation that needs to be had. They have a very specific niche. They know who their audience is. They know what their audience buys. They know that their audience listens to them and they know what types of services their audience is interested in. And so because they've done all that research, they know those analytics, they can go to a brand that meets, that checks off all those boxes and say, my audience is going to be obsessed with your service. This is perfect. Let's figure out a way to do this. And they do. And so when it's a natural fit like that, and when you know who your audience is, when you know who is listening to you, and then you can show those that engagement. Because let's face it, as I'm sure we've seen with like the stuff coming out that Unilever's talking about with fake followers and the inflated numbers, the brands are really looking to form, I think, more specific long-term relationships with fewer people who are talking to the people the brands want to talk to. So do your research and know who they're talking to, and that will help you with your pricing because engagement is everything. And knowing what the brand wants, their key performance indicators or their KPIs is everything. I sort of feel like everybody has, you have to have kind of a base. I can't take less than this for a sponsored post because of the time value of, you know, the value of my time. I know how long it's going to take. And you sort of in your head have like this hourly sort of rate that this is mine. And that's personal to everybody. You just have to know what's worth it for you. But if you can go to somebody and say, okay, this is my minimum in my head. They don't need to know that. Don't put that on your rate sheet as Jenny has no. said. But if you sort of know that's what's your minimum, but then you can add so much more to that, then your rate goes up. And depending on what you're offering, I almost look at it as like steps. So know what your baseline is. That's your walk away. If you can't pay me, and I'm using random numbers, $500 for this project, I can't, I can't do anything about it. But if my base is 500 and I know that I have 10,000 people who cannot, are going to go out and buy your product, there's metrics for that. So that's how you slowly increase. And you can show that um, through real analytics. So talk to me a little bit about determining those KPIs, because I know some brands come right out and say, this is what we want. We need this. And then there are a lot of brands who are dipping their toe into the influencer waters and just starting that. And, and that's a negotiation thing is figuring that out. So can you yep. talk about that? You have to ask, <laughs> really. And if they aren't sure, you have to, as because like you said, the brands that are sort of dipping their toe in the water, they might be looking to you for some education. You are an expert um, in creating this content and who your audience is. And so you may need to lead them and tell them what you can do for them. Because the fact is, it really depends. If a brand wants to drive sales, you, sometimes influencers aren't the best bet for that. 
But if a brand wants to have, you know, more of an awareness or there's a specific campaign or there's a new product they want buzz about, it really depends on what they're looking for. But if a brand comes to you and says, I want you to post about my car and you need to sell 15 cars, you may be like, oh, wow, I'm, <laughs> that's not going to work. And no. then you can sort of educate them on the fact that that's not the best way to eat to talk to your audience or what you're going to get. Right. So you need to start asking those sort of probing questions of what are you looking to get out of this or what do you need? And that will help you to sort of talk to them about the type of work that you can do for them. So, yeah, so I, I'm going to put you on the spot with this one, but what are some of like, like for your, like if you're building your toolbox for negotiating and talking with brands and talking on the phone, um, what, can you give like three questions that are great to just have in the toolbox? Like just to, like you just said, what are you looking to get out of this? I love that question. Open-ended questions. What, what could we have Always here? Open-ended questions. I think a really great question to ask is how the brand found you and why they're okay. interested in you, because that will let you know what they think of you and what they think of your site and what they think your site is and who they think you are. So one, you may have to correct some misconceptions <laughs> um, or you might be able to say, oh, you're right. And there's so much more. Um, and so I think getting an idea from that brand of just who, who they think you are and why they're interested in you is, is really, I think, a, an interesting question. I got to tell you, when someone gets on the phone with me and wants to talk to me about hashtag legal, that's one of the main questions I ask is like, how'd you find me? You know, why, um, if, if it's not something I already know, or like, what, what about us was interesting? Because, you know, we're a very specific law firm for very specific people. And so I'm sort of kind of interested in that because I want to make sure I'm, I'm the right fit for them every bit as much as they're the right fit for me. Um, and so that's, I think, a really great question. I think asking straight out, what are your KPIs is great. If they are not able to articulate that, I guess I would say, what are your goals? You know, what's the organization goals? I would ask, are there new products on the horizon that you're going to be talking about? Um, you know, how do you like to communicate with your audience? What, who is your audience? Who are you trying to reach? Um, things like that, I think, are really great questions. Um, just this is your information gathering. And you may be able to gather this information without even talking to someone. So you may be able to walk in and say, hey, I read this amazing article. And I saw that you guys are promoting this new brand or this new product. I love this product. My audience would love this product. How do you think we can work together? And they're like, whoa, she, she knows her stuff. So I think yeah. being educated and having information is great. Or am I right about that? Is this, you know, what are you trying to do? These open-ended questions, I think, are, are the best way to just sort of gather that information that you need. Absolutely. And I think, yeah, there's nothing... This is the time to go ahead and be Hermione Granger, be the nerdy A student, do all the research, have the hand going up in the air. Oh, I am the number one fan. I know all your stats. I collected yeah. your baseball cards. I know everything yeah. about you. Yeah. And I think, that, yeah, it's such a good time because like I always say that maybe during, during the negotiation phase, that's when you play it cooler. But mm -hmm. during the phase where you're starting to gather this information, you can totally fangirl, do it. I think it's great. And a good rule of thumb is 70, 30, 70% 70 listening, 30% talking. So if you're sort of like, I don't know how much to talk, that's a really good sort of percentages for each. James, can I just say that 70, 30 is my key number for sponsored versus non-sponsored content. So ah, we should, uh, what cool. do you know? Well, it all comes, it's all coming together. So, okay, I'm going to go back to another question that we had. Sure. All right. What is, oh, sorry, I lost my, are, are emails really legally binding or when is it appropriate to ask for a contract addendum versus just going with an email? Sure. Um, so the answer, the short answer is they can be, which is my most legal answer of all. It depends. <laughs> it depends. That's the answer I was like. Yes, emails can form a contract. And I will tell you that I have definitely pieced together emails when dealing with a contract issue when there wasn't a contract in place. It is not ideal because frequently emails don't deal with things like what state's law applies. <laughs> you know, like oh. <laughs> think about it. Like if I'm in New Jersey and my client's in California, well, whose state law applies? And what if the state law is different? And what if we have a real fight? And you have a whole other fight you don't want to deal with. That's, it's something no one ever thinks about. But there's a lot of terms that are just not included in emails that are included in contracts. 
indemnification provisions are a big one. Um, limitations of liability, a lot of times they're limited to just the dollar amounts that are paid underneath the contract. Um, there's lots of these legalese that don't appear in emails. So Pause. What is indemnification? What the heck is that? Oh, sorry. So an indemnification provision means that I am essentially saying, Jenny, if we go into business together and another party sues you because of your appearance with me, and this is one example, there's many different ways you can draft it. I will pay all of your legal fees, costs, expenses, pursuant to some, you know, certain obligations, and I'm not going to go into that, but it protects you, Jenny, from your appearance with me. So for example, if I'm a brand and I hire Jenny to do an amazing video and I give her this product, and then it turns out that the product gets recalled because somebody gets incredibly hurt, and then Jenny suddenly gets sued because, you know, she endorsed this product, and then all of a sudden, you know, I did this. Yeah, exactly. Um, Jenny can come back to me under a good indemnification clause and say, whoa, I never would have been sued if you wouldn't have given me this product and told me that it was safe, but it wasn't. And so now, Jamie, I need you to pay for all my costs, fees, and you know, defense costs. So that's what indemnification is. And you'll see it in most agreements. But those aren't in there um, when you have just an email. Yeah. Yeah, you're totally right. All right. So this is a big, huge one that I've seen many, many, many times uh, in working um, in influencer marketing and, and through Mediavine's influencer agency and all of it. So how do we handle it when a brand changes expectations, deliverables, deadlines, mid campaign? Dorothy asked us on Facebook. Dorothy Curran said, I'd love to know a good way to write in language that stipulates they will pay more for over X amount of revisions. How do we handle this? Because it happens all the all time. The, it's a great question. And so what you should have is very clearly defined deliverables. And then you should have a line in there that says anything outside of the scope of these deliverables will be subject to additional fees, a proposal or an estimate will be provided upon request. That's it. So, I mean, as long as you have those deliverables very clear and that includes drafts. So I always put in something that says drafts are not accepted, drafts are accepted, or sometimes it could be that you know, the brand is permitted one round of revisions, or sometimes it'll be the brand can revise, but only related to brand messaging, not related to the author's tone. That's another one because, you know, you don't obviously want your voice to be sort of squashed in this post or whatever it is that you're doing. But, you know, if you haven't presented the brand correctly or you're not using their, you know, their marketing correctly or their message correctly, then allowing the brand to fix that is in always everybody's best interest. But you know, there's a big difference between that and somebody asking you to reshoot a video because they don't like what you did. Um, so as long as you've met all the deliverables, you can go back to them and say, I understand that, you know, you're not happy with this. So I'd like to work with you. However, these were my deliverables. This video meets them. This is how this is what the extra cost is going to be for me to reshoot it. And I'm happy to do it, but I can't do it for free. Excellent. I think part of this problem can hopefully be solved by the communication continuing throughout the process so that there's a clear, like you said, the clear definition of deliverables. And that starts with a conversation where you're listening to what they need and everyone is on board, but there are times when the brand changes their minds midstream. And how do you, so what, let's say you've, you've got a contract, but you did not necessarily clearly define the deliverables or you weren't as clear and, or you did, and they just come back and say, we need this changed. How do you handle that? Do you just start drafting at that point? Do you see a lawyer? What do you do? Um, I think my recommendation when someone comes to me with this issue is try to do it yourself. I okay. never, ever, ever, once the lawyers get involved, everything changes, the tone changes. So I will frequently advise clients behind the scenes and they'll never know I exist. And that's an okay thing because a lot of times it's a lot. Even I'm, I think I'm a very nice person. And you even are. as amicable as I can be and as incredible, I'm always trying to just sort of make everything, I don't want things to be adversarial. I want to, if I have to step in, I just want to negotiate to the end and have everybody just agree on something and be done. That's my goal. I don't want to be billing all these hours. Like I know sometimes lawyers get that bad reputation. And because yeah. there are some very adversarial lawyers, unfortunately, when a lawyer steps in, people get very nervous and they sort of freak out. So my recommendation is always do your best to do it yourself. Talk to a lawyer, consult with a lawyer so you know what your rights are. There's absolutely nothing wrong with hopping on a half an hour call with an attorney and saying, here's my contract, 
this is what's going on, what can I do, and having them walk you through it. But my recommendation is try to do it yourself. And then if you know something does come in the end and there's papers at the end, there's settlement releases, whatever the case may be, have a lawyer look at that as well. Um, but a back and forth negotiation, if the deliverables aren't clear, unfortunately, then you're it's not as cut and dry. And sometimes you are on the hook for those changes and I've seen that happen. Try to avoid the TBD in your contracts. I see it all the time. Timeline TBD, and then a you know a client, uh, uh, an influencer comes back and they're like, they've held on to my draft for three months and they won't pay me until the final. I'm like, but you didn't make them give you an okay. We will write in language that essentially says you can't hold my draft for longer than a couple weeks, and if you do, you still have to pay me for my time spent. So it's those types of things that you don't see happening because you have this very amicable relationship. But as a lawyer, <laughs> I am trained to see worst case scenarios, which I'll never tell you. <laughs> but I can try to prevent them in the drafting of the contract. But try to avoid the TBDs. I, I cringe when I see those. The TBDs and also, um, yeah, the, the I think that one of the big things that I've seen is that the brands are oftentimes not to give brands a bad name, you guys are great, but I think the brands are very eager to put a deadline on you, on the influencer, but not to put a deadline on themselves. And if they're asking for draft approval, they need a deadline too. Like there's gotta be a finite time. Yes, yeah, no, I, I see posts in Facebook groups all the time. My, the brand has had my draft or the agencies have my draft for three months. I don't even have a contact with the brand. I don't even know if the brand's seen it. What do I do? Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's important. So um, I think, are, are you seeing that in, in your experience that brands are starting to get a little more understanding of the influencer world and that sphere? Are you seeing that becoming a little easier? Because I think, I think that sometimes that I've, I've seen a lot of complaints that there's not a lot of understanding about the editorial calendar. There's not a lot of understanding about what it takes to do this, what it means, because it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. I'm definitely seeing huge changes. Um, I'm seeing that there's a lot more understanding of um, what the benefits of working with influencers is. And so once there's an understanding of those benefits, I'm seeing that there's a lot more flexibility in understanding how influencers work. Um, and like I said, I'm also seeing a lot more long-term relationships. So once you form that relationship, it becomes really kind of nice because the brand will come back to you or want to work with you for a full year. So they sort of know your process, you know their process, you know their internal people. You don't feel like you're sending an email to a black hole. <laughs> That's just nobody's responding. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely finding that there's a lot. I mean, look, it's still, I, I just heard it referred to as the wild, wild west. Oh. <laughs> which made me laugh a little bit. I mean, look, it's constantly changing. I mean, what it is, what influencer marketing is today is not what it was a year ago or three years ago. And I don't think we had that term five years ago, no. but um, I think there's just sort of the more that influencers treat their their sites and their and their their work as a business, I think that the more it's going to force the hand of networks and brands to continue to feel that way too. Um, and look, if you're an influencer and you don't want it to be a business, it's just a hobby to you. That's awesome, and I love that. But if you are trying to make money at this, and if you are treating it like a business, then you have to treat it like a business all around. Um, and that means sometimes making the hard choices and asking for the hard things like the contract. Um, and sometimes if it's a brand who's never worked in influencer marketing, sometimes it means having your own contract. Good, that totally leads us to a question that Megan asked us. Megan Snow, which I love her name, that is amazing. Sounds like a Disney character. What is the most common mistake bloggers make when it comes to drafting their own contracts? Um, honestly, it's taking their friend's contracts um, or taking a, con like Googling contracts and <laughs> pulling free templates offline and then smashing contracts together that may not even relate to the business. Um, thinking that something sounds very legal when it really doesn't mean anything. I've definitely seen clauses where I'm like, this doesn't, this has, this has no meaning at all. Um, so, so how do, what's the alternative? I mean, there, there are definitely some templates out there that are good sites that you can pay for. Um, talking to an attorney and having, you know, just knowing that they're going to draw you up with a template contract that you can use for every sponsored campaign going forward. 
a lot of times, like I have a lot of clients that are in the services business or I have influencer clients. I draft them a contract one time. They use it for multiple clients and that's okay. If there's significant changes that can be made, then they come back to me and say, hey, I have this like kind of strange thing going on and it may take me 20 minutes to fix and it's not that much time, but then they know it's drafted correctly. So like I said, sort of looking at it is just one of those costs. You know, it's the same with trademarking or names. You know, a lot of people will go in and they'll do a quick Google search and say, oh, nobody has this name. I'm good. But then, you know, they come to me a couple of years later when they're making a lot of money and I do my search, which is very different than uh, somebody who just Googles it. And I say, Ooh, not only can you not trademark this, but you're actually infringing on somebody else's mark. So it, um, I hate those conversations. I don't like those conversations. And so it, it's sort of like, just know that it's going to be a cost that you're going to have to have and go in knowing that that's just one of those business costs. It's sort of like when I, I, I pay somebody to deal with all my books and my taxes and it hurts to write that check. But I know that if I don't, I will screw it up royally. I think that the other thing that you get when you have a lawyer at some, a physical body lawyer at some point in the process is the support yeah. managed hosting versus not managed hosting. If something gets borked, or there's a problem, I know I have a person, an actual live human being that I can turn to and say, look, this is the thing. And there are times when you just need it. And you know, I, I think that that's, that's an important thing. So is there anything else that you wanna talk on in terms of, oh, here's a good one, okay. You said we need to have, this is probably be our last question unless anyone else has one more thing. So when, when is it time to walk away and how's the best way to walk away without burning a bridge? I love this question. Um, always my, my biggest piece of advice is no matter how insulted you are by the prospect of someone blasting a press release at you that has no relation to anything that you do versus the person who approaches you and does know what you do, but it's like, I don't have any money, but do you want to post about this? Just be kind and be professional and just say, you know, as much as I love your product and I hope to have the opportunity to work with you in the future, it sounds like we're not going to be able to come to a deal on this. Please keep me in mind for future opportunities and I'll check in with you in a couple months to see if anything has changed. That's really it. Simple. For me, it's, it, you'd be surprised at the number of times that we had uh, one client who they had everything in this agreement that they possibly wanted. They had the money, they had everything was great. The client wanted this strange personal guarantee, something I had never seen before. And I even called Danielle, my partner. I'm like, have you ever seen this? It's crazy. And um, she was like, no. And we went back to the client and we're like, this is what this means. And at our client, I mean, who was the influencer and everything else was great about this. And this was not a small dollar contract. And our client went back to their client and said, I'm not signing this with this in here. And the deal went away because wow. of that one small thing, because it was really significant. And a week later, they came back and said, we've revised our position and we're willing to do the contract without the clause. So you'd be shocked at the number of times when you are just strong on what it is that, that you believe in. And that was a real deal breaker. And the deal breakers are very specific to you, very specific to your business. There are some things that I have clients that they literally don't care about that my next client I talk to, that is their everything. That is 100%. You know, sometimes I have clients who are like, I will not take photos of my kids. That's a deal breaker. No, yeah. thank you. And other clients who love to take photos of their kids. It is very personal. And that is all about knowing your business and knowing what you need in order to be most effective in your business. But be kind. Always, of always. Let's just start out there. Baseline, be kind. Be kind. Be kind. Just That's talk just, to somebody yeah. as you want to be talked to. Just because you're, you're behind a computer doesn't mean that those words are not going to come back. They're actually a lot more permanent when you put them on the computer than when you say them out of your mouth in a public space. So remember that. Uh, okay, Jamie, always amazing. Got one question that will lead into our final. Jill Selkowitz wants to know, she said, Jamie, I did a contract myself based on a friend's contract. The brand wants a couple of minor changes before I do this. Can I send it to you for review? And can you give me a thumbs up or down? Then for future tweaks, can I send it to you again? Yes. <laughs> she says thumbs yes, up. So Jamie, where can we find you? We do that all the time. So you can check us out at hashtag dash legal.com. Um, you can email me directly, Jamie, J-A-M-I-E, at hashtag dash legal.com. 
And you can check out our podcast where we talk about all things influencer marketing. And Jenny was a recent guest. It was amazing. And that's the Business Ease Influencer Marketing Podcast. So that has lots of great information um, all about. And we definitely have a whole bunch on contracts. It's amazing. I listen to it all the time. It is always a pleasure just to talk to you and see you. I love it. Uh, so thank you to Jamie for coming on. Next week for the Summer of Live, we have uh, we have Peter Green from Agathon and Lauren Gray from Once Couple. We are going to talk blog tech 911. Anyone out there who has got problems under the hood, in the back end, all those awkward ways of talking about it, that is what we're talking about next week. So we'll talk site speed. We'll talk when your site works. We're here to talk about those things. We'll be live. So we are continuing on in the summer. If there's things you want to hear about that we, we can talk about, email me, Jenny at Mediavine.com. Get on Facebook. We're everywhere. We thank you so much for being here, guys. Thanks again to Jamie. Thank you. And fun. enjoy their day. Bye. Bye.